This podcast is powered by Pelotonia. To learn more about our goal to end cancer, visit pelotonia.org or see the link in the episode notes. We had been uh, wanting to to have a child for for several years uh, and had been in fertility treatment and uh, and really struggled with it. And uh, so in uh, early 2016, we uh, did IVF Mm -hmm. and it was a successful IVF. Then uh, when I was about eight weeks pregnant, so still in that first trimester. Just a couple of weeks after we found out that it was a successful uh, IVF yeah. implantation. I, I found a lump and uh, once we got into, out of the fertility office and into the regular um, OBGYN yeah. office, we ha- looked into it further and it I went through the testing processes and it turns out to be cancer. I, I mean, by the end of that weekend, Maggie was very resolute and um, no matter what, we are committed towards having this child beating cancer, finishing the PhD, and moving home with our lives. Welcome to One Goal, a podcast from Pelotonia. We're a community that's dedicated to funding life saving cancer research through a three day experience of cycling and volunteerism. I'm your host and ride community manager, Jill Landino. Your journey with us to the finish line begins now. Through research, we will see an end to cancer. Thankfully, every single penny raised through our riders, virtual riders, and volunteers goes directly towards the solution. This is made possible by our major funding partners, the Elburns Foundation, Huntington, the American Electric Power Foundation, and Peggy and Richard Santuli. It's because of them, all of our partners, and this dedicated community that all of this is possible. For Jeremy Smith and Maggie Wetzel, the best news they could have hoped for was followed by some of the worst. In 2016, they lived near Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and Maggie was expecting their son Isaac. Not long after, she was told that she also had breast cancer. In the midst of all this, Maggie was preparing to complete her PhD, and a move to Columbus, Ohio was on the horizon. It didn't take long for both of them to integrate themselves into their new community. They both work at The Ohio State University, where Maggie is an assistant course coordinator at the Center for Life Sciences Education, and Jeremy is an academic program coordinator at the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. They're also both members of OSU's Super Peloton Team Buckeye, and Jeremy serves as the captain for the College of Arts and Sciences group. In his writer profile, Jeremy writes, We felt like a Category 5 hurricane was blowing through our lives, and all we could do was hold on, white-knuckled, and hope that modern medicine would prevent our love story from being cut short. We continue Jeremy and Maggie's story as they face down that Category 5 hurricane in this episode for Isaac. That kind of uh, real defiance in the face of cancer was inspiring for me as her husband. I felt like my role was to support her in any way I can and let her know that she's never going to go through any of it alone and that we have good doctors. And and, and we also felt that, that... uh, she was young and fit and very healthy and had lived a very healthy lifestyle. Um, so we felt that you know, we can get through this together. Here I am pregnant with probably about 17 weeks pregnant. Finding out that I have cancer with, and I'm pregnant with our first child that we had tried so hard to conceive. Yeah. So, so you said it, that would probably be the most difficult time. <laughs> I can't imagine. And I still hadn't completed my PhD at that time. I was I was in my last semester, and mm-hmm. um, I guess it was a spring semester when I found out. And this, I, I want to keep this baby healthy. Yeah. I want to, we have something to look forward to. Mm-hmm. There's this mm-hmm. sense of hope yeah. that was also brought mm-hmm. along. If, if I can add, I yeah. you know, we... The first couple appointments with doctors were, you know, basically in small conference rooms because there had to be uh, baby doctors. We were already considered a high-risk pregnancy because of it being IVF. And then, you know, medical oncologists, surgical oncologists. Mm -hmm. and um, Yeah, and they kind of come in one at a time and talk to you. And it's a very long day of, oh, this is what we're going to (laughs) do. But an impressive amount of coordination. And it it was obvious to us the entire time as, as, you know, people that appreciate science and research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that so much research, so many people had been involved in learning how to deal with this issue of um, we have an aggressive cancer that we need to take care of, but we also have 
a pregnant mother that really wants to birth a healthy child. And yeah. um, for us, the the feeling of, of of gratitude for having all of those people, the ones we interacted with, and the many that were involved with, you know, developing that that body of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, it was uh, an overwhelming feeling of gratitude. Yeah, the, uh, there yeah. there had to have been someone who was in the same situation and decided to let's go through with this treatment and see what happens. Yeah, um, and I I think this is probably still being studied on on the effects um, because people don't know how much of that crosses the placental barrier. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot. At least we yeah. we didn't get a good answer on that. Um, yeah, a lot of, a lot like of the gotta... answers to questions that we had were, well, we think maybe this is the best path or, you know, we we, yeah. we consulted doctors at, at various other institutions. The the people at the uh, uh, the Mills Breast Cancer Center in Urbana were, were incredible. Maggie's attitude with it was really inspiring uh, that she knew that she was the only one that, uh, you know, could – nurture this unborn child and she also had to think about her long-term health and the strength that she showed as far as okay what's the next step okay what's the next step I, and I really did keep it okay what's what's here and the doctors try to do a, a pretty good job of that they, at the end of the meaning look at helping you look help, towards milestones helping you, yeah helping out. you look towards what the next step is oh, okay Without but, being overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah. but not but going on to, to the step to. beyond that, Okay, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. It they, does. They, yeah. they do a pretty good job of saying, okay, now we're going to do this. Now we're going to do this. Yeah. This is – which they it, gave us an outline of how it would go, but kind of stopped at a certain point. Sure. Which maybe took me by surprise, that the, all the things that would happen after the active treatment process. Mm-hmm. But it really did keep you focused on the task at hand. Mm-hmm. Or at least for me, it did. It worked pretty well. I remember many of these early meetings with doctors and, you know, they would start explaining things in the way that they typically explain things to patients. And she would ask a couple of questions and then I'd see a look come on their face and they'd say, what do you do? <laughs> yeah. And so we had say, that conversation and then they would up the game a yeah, little bit uh, and we could have a, a further conversation. And sometimes I would have to go back and to my non-science husband, we, we would have to have that conversation about, mm-hmm. okay, because this is what we talked about, and I'm going to simplify it. Bring so it that down. Yeah, yeah. The, the conversation <clears throat> progressed on a level that was beyond my understanding, right? <laughs> and she was, you know, actively reading primary research mm-hmm. about how to deal with breast cancer in pregnant women and yeah. was able to, like, actually take printed articles in and, and say, like... Wow. Most of the time, they suggested them because they had done their research. Yeah. I, I will be... Quite honest. Uh, although it's not in your your <clears throat> field, you understand how publishing research works and experiments and and all of those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, that it was very beyond me, and, and I, I experienced the vocabulary yeah. for talking about that and understanding. I experienced seeing you yeah, sure. uh, have added confidence because you really understood what was going on mm-hmm. in your body and. I, I really don't think that most people in this situation have that sense of of really understanding in a deep way. And, and, and I didn't, but I saw that you gained confidence from you, – you were empowered by having that background. And, and I think that that was big actually. I do. So throughout your pregnancy, you know, you have the mastectomy. Um, that was during pregnancy, the, the surgery you referred to. Is that right? Yes, I had a mastectomy. Yeah. They would only do – one, because they were concerned about the time spent under anesthesia. Gotcha. So we, I ended up having a mastectomy when I was pregnant. Mm-hmm. And then I later had a surgery to input the port because mm-hmm. I have tiny veins and it, it was just going to be easier for, for me to get a port yeah. um, for the chemotherapy. I remember... Uh, a really special moment the day after the mastectomy because yeah. this is early in the second trimester and we're you know we're terrified of how this is going to impact Isaac. And I will say things move quickly. Once you get diagnosed they're like, "Okay, we need to we need to do surgery right now." Yeah, so w- w- the time between the diagnosis and the mastectomy was was probably less than 2 weeks. It was, wow. was quite quick. Yeah, I think I was 
it was like the 23rd or 27th of April, maybe mm-hmm. 25th, somewhere around there of April mm-hmm. that I, I got the call. It was a Friday, so we could figure that out. And then out. May 13th, 2016 May 13th was a mastectomy. May 13th was my mastectomy, so it was wow. very... It was a quick turnaround. Yeah. So uh, what I was going to say is that I remember the next morning, uh, you know, in the hospital, the, the, the Dr. Ray, the surgeon, had ordered a, a full sonogram as a way to reassure us mm-hmm. that, you know, that, you know, so into, into our hospital room came uh, the portable sonogram. We weren't expecting it and did the sonogram and as a way to say that everything's doing fine. He's very healthy. Look, okay. here's your baby. And it was actually oh. the best sonogram pictures we yeah. had the whole pregnancy. He was pregnancy. kicking his little leg. Really? Oh. So after the sonogram, you were going to defend your thesis for your doctorate, right? What did those next few weeks look like? Defended on August 4th, had chemo, I think it was August 10th, if mm-hmm. I'm remembering the dates correctly. And then we waited until 37 weeks. So we went in on the 12th or mm-hmm. 13th of... September. The evening of September 12th, and he was ended up being born September 14th yes, after a, a, a long, long labor. A long, very long yeah. labor. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So just another thing that's... Yeah. <laughs> I ended up having to have a C-section because I was pushing so long that they kind of put the knips on. <laughs> They're okay. like, all right, we need to move on to, to just to this, an emergency C-section. Getting him out. Instead and, of, uh, yeah. I would say that that surgery probably was the worst of all the surgeries that I had just because... Really? Um, well, the mental preparedness mm-hmm. wasn't there because I, it was an emergency C-section. Yeah. So I was pretty... I would say I was pretty out of it. It was wonderful to hold him, but also you have this idea of of a baby and, and what, what it's going to be like, and then there's a reality yeah. of what it actually is like. So it was kind of an interesting juxtaposition, I suppose, um, I mean, it was wonderful to hold him, but it was also like, oh, this is what you are. Like, yeah. It was kind of like, a, oh. <laughs> you seem moment. like an Isaac. And I was also <laughs> kind of out of it at the same time. Yeah. And emotional because, it, you know, I was in there. It was just emotionally a long tired. day. <laughs> I, I can't It was imagine. a very long time. Well, we, so you probably have a better recollection of that. Well, we didn't find out gender. Uh, and I think part of that was, you know, Maggie likes surprises. I do. He but, does not. <laughs> but I, I think also, uh, you know, reflecting back on it now, and I've thought a lot about this since he was born, that we were trying actively not to feel too attached. Like we knew that there was a possibility of this not turning out well and that, that there being – not. Cross, that did not cross my mind. I, I think that it was an unconscious motivation of, of you know, why I, I went along so readily with not finding Perhaps. out gender. So when he was yeah. born, you know, I, we you know we were told that he was a boy, and uh, and you know, of course, we were both like, "How is everything okay?" You know, yeah. count the fingers, mm-hmm. count the toes. Um, <laughs> I think that there um, was a a hidden benefit that that probably most people wouldn't anticipate for me as a father. You know, I uh, I was a new father bonding with, with my son and um, I was really forced to take uh, 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 the lead mm-hmm. on on parenting and, and caring for the newborn for the first uh, couple months because she still had, uh, you know, a cycle of chemotherapy and the second mastectomy to deal with in addition to, you know, healing from uh, the C-section that I really had a lot of bonding time with him early and... I've talked to other friends of mine that that have become fathers, you know, in in the last few years, and they tell me that the first couple of months are really hard because the mom has to, especially if the mother's breastfeeding, mm-hmm. has to just whole regulate her whole life around that, right? And that you don't have as much bonding time as a father with the child because you're not feeding them, right? Mm-hmm. And and um, because she had to quit, you know. Uh, you, she had to quit breastfeeding pretty soon. He switched to the bottle pretty young, mm-hmm. and and I had to really take a lead on you know middle of the night and early morning feedings, and and I felt like that made the bonding process with him for me, uh, you know, really facilitated it. That I had to be uh, much more of a hands on dad than I think a lot of dads are able to be. So the baby's home. You're going through the rest of your treatments. Um, when do you, you know, get the get the message of, of all clear? And when do you kind of feel like you're 
Um, out of the out of the woods to say. <laughs> I think that we were all clear after the the first surgery. Okay. But there's always a chance that it could crop back up. So mm-hmm. there's always this thing that could be yeah happen the in the future life. for yeah. the rest of for the rest of your life. Yeah. yeah. And and she's and she's BRCA have, positive. Mm-hmm. Um so you know, there's there's also long term concerns has, about ovarian cancer as well. Yeah. yeah. So there's always going to be that. Sure. And to think about in the future. And it, once you've had cancer, you have a higher risk of having yeah. cancer again. So yeah. I think that's always there, but I try not to focus on that. Yeah. You know, we felt that we felt that we had beat the cancer before Isaac was born and were able to transition to mm-hmm. um, focusing on him and then focusing on post-treatment and, and just, I mean, honestly, how we're going to do that logistically. Mm-hmm. We lived in Champaign-Urbana and we were, you know, four or five hours away from family support and we had mm-hmm. a lot of friends that were incredible. And I will say my family was amazing. They came up, one of them came up once a week and then after the baby was born, someone would come sit with me or take care of the baby depending on logistics you yeah. tended to take care of the baby mm-hmm. and maybe dad would come or mm-hmm. my mom would come or my work was inherently international you know i was designing study abroad programs for the university of illinois and yeah. and traveling internationally and trying to make that work and you know i you know i've got to go to sweden sometime in the next few months i'm going to be mm-hmm. gone about a week when does that week fit in let me yeah. look at your chemo schedule right yeah. so yeah. So that was, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I feel like we were very fortunate in that way because my I have such a great family support. I'm, yeah. I mean. Yeah, they're incredible. Now, I know Maggie had a job offer uh, that was waiting for her in Columbus. And you guys moved here soon after Ike's arrival then? Actually, it happens to be, just by coincidence, uh, that we moved into Columbus Pelotonia weekend 2016. Really? It was the first weekend of August. Um, so... I I heard about the first day we were here, like watching local news, which is one of the things you do when you move to a new city. Um, the move process was very rapid. I actually didn't see the house we were moving into until I was carrying furniture into it because she did all of the, you know, scouting and, and yeah, there ha- were, house finding. It was a, a, almost exactly a month between when I found out that I was hired and to the, the day, day we, that moved. we moved. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so it was, it was very a very quick, quick process. Yeah. So uh, I learned about it. And, you know, you're you're leery. You're moving to a new city. Uh, I didn't know anyone in Columbus mm-hmm. at all. Um, but I had this, this interest in cycling, uh, and I heard about it. And I obviously had this, this very fresh connection to cancer and, and, as I mentioned before, overwhelming gratitude towards uh, cancer research and, and how important that is mm-hmm. uh, was visceral, right? Um, so I heard about it, and I immediately wanted to be involved. And, and when I started at Ohio State, I I reached out to uh, Terry, who was the captain of the College of Arts and Sciences team, and and you know she got me involved right away. So you know the the one year anniversary of us moving to Columbus was my first was my first ride. I've since kind of taking on more responsibility. So I'm serving as captain of the College of Arts and Sciences team this year and yeah. giving Terry a break. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it uh, in an interesting way, it was the first thing I knew about Columbus. And he inspired me to ride, just going to the different stops that we cheered him on yeah. and seeing the event and how hard he worked for it and, and all the fundraising that's involved um, inspired me to do it this year. And the fact that he is planning on doing the 100 mile on Saturday, he's backing down a little bit so that I can ride with him. So we're, I, I was inspired by that. But also, as a scientist, yeah. I, I know how research moves along, and I know that funding is needed. And if we don't fund, then we don't perhaps get some of these new and effective treatments. Um, so, I, you know, Mary's my love of science and my history with cancer and it's a good fit. So there may be a lot of people who are listening to this podcast or who would listen to it in, you know, months and years to come that could be on the fence about participating in Pelotonia as a writer, as a virtual writer, whatever. Um, Having done it, Jeremy, what, what would you say to 
somebody who's on the fence like that? Yeah, I would say that, um, first of all, the fundraising commitment is very intimidating. You know, uh, I was intimidated last year. It wasn't as difficult as I thought, but also... Um, it's a real great opportunity to reach out to your friends and family and talk about what you value, what's important to you, and um, you know, putting your money where your mouth is, so to speak. Uh, so, so there's that, that the fundraising commitment is not as daunting as it might initially seem. And, and it does seem daunting. And for, it does. I, you know, we, we, have, does. we have two fundraising commitments this year. So if, if, you're looking, uh, if, if, if you're looking for someone to support, I, we would de- definitely appreciate your support. Um, so that's one is that, that it's not as daunting as it initially seems. Your friends and family uh, will welcome the opportunity to, to show you support. And then the other thing I would say is that the experience is just really special. It's um, it's a feeling of community, uh, of togetherness. You know, people are very much on the same page. It's very, very positive. Um, I don't know if I've ever experienced a day in my life where I was surrounded by so much joyfulness of just people that were just really happy and smiling. And uh, I don't think I've ever experienced a day of my life of hearing the word thank you more. I mean, you just hear it nonstop. And and it's not a, a flippant thank you. It's it's heartfelt and meaningful. And, um, and you're inspired by other people. Uh, you know, we mentioned uh, – we talked earlier before we started recording about how – uh, cycling is this great leveling uh, that you see people of all ages and all backgrounds and um, all body types and uh, just kind of sharing this experience together. Um, for me, it made me feel more than anything else that I've experienced here. It made me feel that Columbus was our home, that we were part of a community. And, and that's important to us, to to feel like we're connected to our community and uh, that we're part of something larger than, you know, our day-to-day grind, so to speak. Well, you know, I think of the the arrow as a symbol of of moving forward, and so much of research is just, you know, incrementally moving, uh, you know, uh, the body of knowledge forward and and an understanding of of treatment and and wellness. Um, that that's the thing that I I always found appealing when I saw the arrow. That it is, it's just moving things forward. It's just moving in, in that positive direction, and um, it's exciting to be part of that. I mean, much of going through this kind of experience that that Maggie and I did was, you know, as I mentioned earlier, all of these unseen people that have helped, you know, many decades ago, right, as far as contributing to funding to support cancer research that led to understanding that supported better treatments that led to better outcomes for Maggie and that it's all part of that process of incrementally moving forward uh, understanding in the goal of, of eliminating cancer as you know, a, a human pestilence, right? Um, if I can add something that, that I, you know, as I, I envision this podcast being listened to, I imagine that there's going to be, because cause actually Cancer diagnosis while pregnant, we've we've discovered, is not incredibly rare, right? Uh, Maggie's on a Facebook group of of women around the world that have been through this. So, yeah. and and she's, I think, gained a lot of uh, strength from from those women. So I, I I would just say that there probably will be people who say, I know someone that's going through that. She should listen to to this couple's story, and so. To those women and those husbands uh, of the women going through uh, this terrifying time of being pregnant and being diagnosed with cancer, I would just say that, um, you know, that there is life past that. And uh, our life has been changed in in ways that are profound, but we're still living the life that that we wanted for for ourselves. And we were able to get through it, and, and you will too, um, that each day is going to be a challenge and that you really have to um, set your expectations of, I'm dealing with the problems that I need to deal with today or this week. And it's, I think, very positive and healthy to kind of look things as step by step by step and not trying to digest the enormity of what you're trying to, to get through. Hey, buddy. You're a big walker. Come here. Come here, Ike. 
this is something that we had both wanted for a long time. Um, we really wanted to be parents and it has been even better than we imagined. Like we love being parents. Um, but just for me, the gratitude of she went through so much and um, she endured so much with a very brave face and a positive attitude all towards the goal of not so much her own health and wellness, but really him uh, and and making sure he was well. You know, she, she stopped taking pain medication after that first mastectomy within a couple of days. And it was really like, yeah, it hurts, but I can deal with it. You know, the less we expose him to, the better. And I just uh, was in awe that she had been through so much and she'd, you know, there's, you know, there's still a lot ahead of us, but I felt like she had successfully brought this beautiful, healthy boy into the world. And um, I just felt my partner is, is a rock star and, and I was really grateful. I'm coming to get you. I'm coming to get you. Jeremy and Maggie are truly such a special couple. Um, you could instantly tell, you know, they are such an amazing partnership. They look at one another and smile, you know, in everything that they say, um, even when it's really challenging stuff to talk about. Um, you can tell that their partnership is so strong um, and their love for their little guy, Isaac, uh, is just so massive. So um, so just thank you so much to both of them for sharing this really incredible and impactful story with us. Their story and so many other stories really drive uh, myself and so many others to, you know, not just come to work at Pelotani every day, but to ask our friends and family and get creative with how we're raising funds and recruiting our friends and family to also participate in Pelotonia. We want to say thank you to our major funding partners for making this podcast and everything we do in the Pelotonia world possible. So thanks to the Alberance Foundation, Huntington, the American Electric Power Foundation, and Richard and Peggy Santulli. The Pelotonia community is really great at thinking of new and innovative ideas to engage their friends and family in fundraising. So at the end of each podcast, we're excited to share with you a story that we've heard that's really just kind of motivated us to want to be better fundraisers and get creative with our own efforts. So my colleague, Olivia Rositz, who's our Ride Community Coordinator, she gets to hear a lot of these stories. So Olivia, from our pals at OSU, what have you heard in, in terms of fun fundraising ideas? Yeah, so... I really love when people bring in their passions and talents and intertwine it in their fundraising efforts. And one woman in particular, Kathy Disher, a chaplain at the James, she has this great baking talent. And what better treat to have from Ohio State than Buckeyes, right? Buckeyes. For those who maybe don't know what a Buckeye is, other than a poisonous nut, <laughs> explain, don't eat those ones. explain what the better version of a Buckeye is. Oh, yeah. It's basically this peanut butter ball. Mm -hmm dipped in chocolate and Kathy makes a lot of them she makes over 120 dozen Buckeyes she is working uh, truly all year round to make these Buckeyes and she sells them for um, a set price per dozen and now she has you know dozens and dozens of doctors and physicians at the James who are buying them for their whole teams for their patients for their floors um, and it's actually if I'm not mistaken allowed her to be a high roller for three years in a row yeah and she's still going. Very good. Thanks so much for sharing, Olivia. Uh, let's keep listening for a preview of our next episode. It was like, you know, you've clocked over a thousand miles on your bike. You really should. You've been a part of us through this whole thing. You really should be um, a part of it. And I was like, I, I ride on a trail. I have no clue what you're talking about. You know, it's like, okay, it's like two days away. He was like, it's okay. So Team Huntington signed me up. Him and Miguel sponsored me five hundred dollars. Oh, so two days before that ride, you didn't oh, think you were doing Peloton? No, I was wow. helping. You were so, just working on your health journey and yeah, starting and to get comfortable. Yeah, I wanted to help the them bike. with their event. I wanted to help friends. You know, that's what you do. So literally, I signed up about two days. It was two days before. It was so awesome, um, and that's when I got the bug. You've been listening to One Goal, a podcast from Pelotonia. Hosted by me, Ride Community Manager Jill Landino, with interview production and scheduling by Marketing Communications Manager Emily Smith. Produced, mixed, and sound designed at the studios of Wessler Media by Vince Tornero. Additional mastering by Joey Gerwin at Orin Judio. Special thank you to all of our guests for being so open and willing to share their stories. Please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast, as that will help others hear these empowering stories. 
If you're curious about joining the Pelotonic community and making an impact on cancer research, please see the link in the episode notes or visit pelotonia.org. That's pelotonia.org.